The second key moment in biblical prophecy is what's known as the Great Tribulation. This period is described as a time of unparalleled suffering that will impact all of humanity. The Bible gives us a glimpse of the scale and intensity of this tribulation, which will unfold in the final days. It's portrayed as a time of extreme hardship, where people will face catastrophic events, persecution, and challenges unlike anything we've ever seen. However, despite the intense suffering, there's a message of hope woven into this prophecy. Those who remain faithful to God and have been redeemed through the blood of Jesus will be saved. They will find purification and peace amid the chaos, a reminder that even in the darkest times, there is always light for those who believe. In the book of Matthew, chapter 24, verses 21 and 22, Jesus himself talks about this period of great distress. He says, For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. This passage underlines just how severe the suffering will be. And yet it also highlights God's mercy. Those days will be cut short for the sake of the faithful, the chosen ones. There's a clear message here. While the tribulation will be intense, it won't last forever. And those who trust in God will endure. In Revelation chapter 7, verse 14, we also see a mention of those who emerge from the Great Tribulation. It says, These are the ones who come out of the Great Tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. This powerful verse brings a message of hope and redemption. It speaks to the salvation of those who stay loyal to God, even in times of extreme suffering. They are the ones who will come out purified, having endured the hardships of the tribulation, but emerging victorious because of their faith. This is a reminder that the trials we face in life, no matter how severe, have the potential to refine us and draw us closer to God. When we think about tribulation in modern times, we can look at the persecuted churches around the world. In various countries, Christian communities are facing conditions that reflect elements of the Great Tribulation. They endure persecution for their faith, living in fear of violence, imprisonment, or worse. Despite these harsh realities, their faith remains unshaken. In fact, many believers draw strength from the very scriptures that talk about the tribulation, seeing their own suffering as a part of a larger divine plan. These communities remind us that tribulation is not just a distant future event. It's something that many Christians are experiencing right now, and their faith is a powerful testament to the hope and endurance the Bible speaks of. The third part of this prophetic journey is the seven bowls of God's wrath, a series of divine judgments unleashed on a sinful humanity. These bowls are described in the book of Revelation in the New Testament, each representing a specific form of punishment that will be poured out upon the earth in the final days. The seven bowls are carried by seven angels, and when poured out, they trigger a series of catastrophic events leading up to the end of times and the final judgment. In Revelation chapter 16, verses 1 through 17, we read about these bowls in detail. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go, pour out the seven bowls of God's wrath on the earth. This marks the beginning of these final judgments, each more severe than the last. The first angel pours out his bowl, and as a result, terrible and malignant sores break out on the people who have the mark of the beast and worship its image. This is the first of many devastating plagues to come. Each bowl of wrath brings with it a specific disaster or affliction that causes suffering to humanity. These punishments are not arbitrary. They are divine responses to the unrepentant nature of humanity at this point in time. Those who have chosen to align themselves with evil will face the consequences of that choice, experiencing firsthand the severity of God's judgment. As the subsequent bowls are poured out, the world is hit with an array of calamities. The sea turns to blood, all marine life dies, rivers and springs become blood, and scorching heat from the sun burns the earth. These events are not only symbolic of the wrath of God, but also serve as a stark warning to humanity. The culmination of these judgments is a reminder that God's patience is not infinite. There will come a time when justice is served, 
and those who have lived in defiance of his will must face the consequences. However, just as with the Great Tribulation, there is a glimmer of hope within these judgments. Even as the bowls of wrath are poured out, there is still an opportunity for repentance. The severity of these judgments is meant to wake people up to the reality of their choices. It's a call to turn away from evil and seek redemption before it's too late. For those who have already put their faith in Christ, these judgments are not a cause for fear, but a reassurance that God's justice will prevail. The faithful are protected from these final punishments, their faith serving as a shield from the wrath that is to come. As we reflect on these prophecies, it's important to remember that while they depict times of intense suffering and judgment, they are not meant to discourage us. Instead, they serve as a reminder of the power of faith and the hope that can be found in God's promises. Even in the darkest times, there is light for those who believe. The message is clear. Remain faithful, trust in God, and no matter what happens, you will find peace and salvation in the end. In today's world, where we see natural disasters, political unrest, and global pandemics, it's easy to feel overwhelmed by the state of things. But these prophecies remind us that there is a larger plan at work. Yes, there will be challenges, and yes, there will be times of hardship. But for those who place their trust in God, these events are not the end. They are the birth pains of something greater, the coming of God's kingdom, where there will be no more suffering, no more pain, and no more death. So, let's hold on to that hope and keep our eyes fixed on the promises that await us. Let's dive into the continuation of this powerful prophetic imagery from the book of Revelation, a biblical text rich with symbolic meaning. One striking series of events is the pouring out of the seven bowls of God's wrath, each representing devastating judgments on humanity. For instance, the second and third bowls cause the seas and rivers to turn into blood, leading to the death of all marine life and the contamination of freshwater sources. This symbolizes the complete destruction of the natural world as we know it, causing unimaginable suffering. Picture it. Oceans teeming with life now transformed into blood, cutting off one of humanity's essential resources. The impact is both literal and spiritual, reminding us of the weight of divine judgment. As we move forward, the fourth bowl brings with it an intense heat from the sun, scorching the earth and inflicting unbearable pain on those exposed to its rays. Imagine the sun, no longer a source of warmth and light, but now a force of destruction, causing blistering heat that no one can escape. It's a terrifying vision, yet it serves to illustrate the seriousness of God's warnings to a rebellious world. The fifth bowl plunges the throne of the beast into darkness, symbolizing not only a literal absence of light, but also a moral and spiritual collapse. The darkness represents the fall of the Antichrist power, showing that even evil has its limits in the face of divine judgment. Then we come to the sixth bowl, described in Revelation chapter 16, verses 12 to 16. Here, the mighty Euphrates River dries up, preparing the way for the kings of the east to march toward the final great battle. This drying up of the Euphrates is highly symbolic, as it paves the way for the ultimate showdown between the forces of good and evil. It signals the gathering of armies for the Battle of Armageddon, a climactic event where the forces of evil will make their final stand against God. Finally, the seventh bowl brings forth lightning, thunder, earthquakes, and hail, a combination of natural disasters that serve as the final exclamation point on God's judgment. Despite all this calamity, the book of Revelation also offers hope. It shows that those who repent and turn back to God will escape His righteous wrath on the day of final judgment. There's always a path to salvation, even in the darkest moments of human history. This is a recurring theme throughout Scripture, that no matter how far we fall, God offers a way back through repentance. The people who heed the warnings, who recognize the power of these judgments, can still find peace and protection in God. Another key element in this prophetic narrative is the mark of the beast. Mentioned in Revelation chapter 13, it represents loyalty to the Antichrist and stands as a symbol of eternal condemnation. The passage describes how all people, regardless of their status, whether rich or poor, 
free or enslaved, will be required to receive a mark on their right hand or forehead. This mark isn't just a symbol. It's a means of control. Without it, no one will be able to buy or sell, creating a system of total dependence on the Antichrist. The text highlights this in verses 16 and 17. And he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast. The control exerted by this mark goes beyond just economic transactions. It's a spiritual decision. Revelation chapter 14, verses 9 and 10 warn of the eternal consequences for those who choose to worship the beast and take his mark. If anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which has poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. This terrifying image of divine wrath speaks to the ultimate price of turning away from God. It's a stark reminder that decisions made in the present have eternal consequences. The mark of the beast serves as a crucial reminder for us to remain faithful to Christ and reject any form of idolatry or allegiance to evil. The figure of the beast itself is another significant character in the book of Revelation, emerging as a powerful and oppressive entity during the end times. The beast is often associated with the number 666, which has come to symbolize corruption and opposition to God. In Revelation chapter 13, verse 18, it says... Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is 666. This number has fascinated and frightened people for centuries, but its deeper meaning lies in what it represents. Complete rebellion against God. The beast exerts a tremendous amount of influence, convincing people to worship what is false and leading them away from divine truth. His authority extends over many, and his ultimate goal is to steer humanity away from God. But the beast doesn't work alone. He is supported by the false prophet, another key figure in these end times events. The false prophet acts as a religious leader, deceiving people with false miracles and pushing them toward the worship of the beast. His deception is subtle yet powerful, leading many astray. In Revelation chapter 19, verse 20, we are told about the fate of the beast and the false prophet. But the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet who had performed the signs on his behalf. With these signs he had deluded those who had received the mark of the beast and worshipped its image. The two of them were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. The symbolism here is clear. Both the beast and the false prophet represent evil forces that seek to turn humanity away from God. They use manipulation, deception, and control to achieve their ends, but ultimately, they are defeated. The final judgment sees them cast into the lake of fire, a powerful reminder that evil will not triumph in the end. As we reflect on these profound and sometimes frightening prophecies, it's important to remember that they aren't just warnings. They're also calls to action. We are encouraged to stay vigilant, to keep our faith strong, and to avoid being led astray by the forces of darkness that exist in the world today. These scriptures remind us of the importance of spiritual discernment, of recognizing the signs of the times, and of holding fast to our commitment to God. No matter what trials come our way, we can take comfort in knowing that God's justice will prevail and that those who remain faithful will find peace now, and salvation in the end. Let's break down one of the most compelling events in biblical prophecy the dramatic final confrontation between good and evil. In Revelation, we are introduced to two major figures who play a crucial role in the end times narrative, the beast and the false prophet. These characters represent not just human agents, but spiritual forces of evil that rise during the last days. The beast is a symbol of oppression and rebellion against God, while the false prophet is a deceiver, performing miraculous signs to lead people astray. Together, they cause many to receive the mark of the beast, aligning themselves with darkness rather than light. Revelation chapter 19 offers a vivid description of their downfall. Both the beast and the false prophet are captured and, in a dramatic turn of events, thrown alive into a lake of fire burning with sulfur. 
This is a powerful image of the ultimate defeat of evil. The lake of fire represents eternal punishment, a final destination for those who oppose God's kingdom. The significance of this moment can't be overstated. It marks the culmination of God's judgment on the forces of darkness. These figures, who have manipulated and deceived so many, are now powerless, facing the consequences of their actions. Their judgment is swift and final, a reminder of the justice that awaits those who turn away from God. But what about the rest of the world? The narrative goes beyond just a beast and false prophet. Revelation paints a picture of a much larger battle, where all the kings of the earth gather their armies to wage war against Christ and his heavenly forces. This leads us to the infamous Battle of Armageddon, a term that has become synonymous with the end of the world. Armageddon, mentioned specifically in Revelation chapters 16 and 19, refers to a literal and symbolic event, a great and final battle between the forces of good and evil. The word itself comes from the Hebrew Har Megiddo, meaning the mountain of Megiddo, a place historically associated with significant battles in ancient Palestine. This setting underscores the gravity of the coming conflict, where spiritual and earthly powers collide in the ultimate showdown. In chapter 19, verses 11 through 21, the Apostle John describes a powerful vision of Jesus Christ leading the charge. In this vision, Christ is depicted as a mighty warrior, riding a white horse and carrying the title Faithful and True. His eyes blaze with fire, symbolizing his righteous judgment, and he wears many crowns, representing his sovereignty over all creation. His name is known only to himself, a mysterious and powerful declaration of his divine authority. Christ's appearance here is both regal and awe-inspiring. He wears a robe dipped in blood, a symbol of his sacrifice and victory over sin, and out of his mouth comes a sharp sword with which he will strike down the nations. Behind him, the armies of heaven follow, also riding white horses and dressed in fine, clean linen, symbolizing purity and righteousness. These aren't just warriors, but the holy ones who stand with Christ in this final battle. As Christ leads his heavenly army, an angel calls out to the birds of the air, inviting them to feast on the flesh of kings, generals, mighty men, and all who have chosen to oppose God. This vivid image illustrates the totality of God's victory over the forces of evil. Nothing is left standing against him, and yet, the focus shifts to the confrontation between the beast, the kings of the earth, and their armies against Christ and his forces. This moment represents the climax of the spiritual war that has been raging since the fall of humanity. The armies of darkness stand no chance. The text emphasizes that the beast and the false prophet are captured without much resistance, showing the absolute authority of Christ over all things. They are thrown alive into the lake of fire, a permanent end to their reign of terror. What happens next is nothing short of divine justice. The remaining enemies are slain by the sword that comes from the mouth of the one riding the white horse, Jesus Christ. This sword is symbolic of his word, his truth, and his righteous judgment. His victory is not just physical but spiritual. With his word, he defeats all those who have turned away from God. The birds, as called by the angel earlier, come to devour the flesh of the defeated enemies, a grim but necessary depiction of the finality of God's judgment. The battle of Armageddon, then, is not merely a future event to be feared. It is the ultimate declaration of Christ's victory over sin, death, and all forms of evil. It's a reminder to all believers that, no matter how dark the world may seem, God's justice will prevail. Jesus, the King of kings and Lord of lords, will return to establish his kingdom, a kingdom characterized by righteousness, peace, and eternal life. The imagery of Christ riding in victory at Armageddon serves as a call to stay faithful, to recognize that no force, no matter how powerful, can stand against the Almighty. The battle of Armageddon is not just about destruction. It is about the triumph of good over evil, the final establishment of God's reign on earth. And while this battle represents the end of an age, it also points to a new beginning, the creation of a new heaven and a new earth where Christ will reign forever. As we reflect on these prophetic passages, 
We should remember that the message of Revelation is one of hope. Though it describes terrifying judgments and the rise of evil forces, it ultimately reveals that God's justice is certain. The defeat of the beast, the false prophet, and all who oppose God is inevitable. In the end, Christ is victorious, and those who remain faithful to him will share in that victory. Armageddon is not the end of the story, but the beginning of a new chapter in God's eternal plan. So, as we face challenges in our own lives, we can hold on to the promise that God will have the final word and His kingdom will be established forever. Let's dive into one of the most powerful and hope-filled promises found in the Bible, the resurrection of the dead. This concept is central to the Christian faith, offering a profound sense of hope for all who trust in Jesus Christ. According to Scripture, there will come a time when the dead will rise and those who have believed in Christ will be given eternal life. This is not some symbolic or metaphorical event. The Bible makes it clear that this is a literal, future occurrence, and the evidence for this is rooted in the resurrection of Jesus himself. When Christ rose from the dead, he showed us that death is not the final destination for those who follow him. He opened the way to eternal life. The Apostle Paul speaks to this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 21 and 22 where he explains that just as death came into the world through one man, Adam, so too does resurrection and eternal life come through one man, Jesus Christ. Paul is emphasizing that while death is a consequence of sin, life and resurrection are the ultimate gifts offered through Jesus. This contrast between Adam and Christ is key. In Adam, all humanity inherited death because of sin, but in Christ, all who believe will be brought back to life. It's a powerful reminder that the pain of death isn't the end for those who are in Christ. Instead, there's a resurrection coming, one where every believer will rise to eternal life. This resurrection isn't something distant or vague. It is a promise that will be fulfilled at the end of time when Jesus returns. At that moment, all who have ever lived will be resurrected and will stand before God. There will be a judgment where each person will be judged according to their actions. Some will be rewarded with eternal life, while others, tragically, will face eternal separation from God. This is often referred to as the second death, where those who are not found in the book of life will be cast into the lake of fire alongside the devil. It's a sobering reality, but also a reminder of the gravity of our choices in this life. For the believer, however, the promise is clear. Eternal life with God, free from pain, sorrow, and death forever. The resurrection represents the ultimate victory over death. And for Christians, it is a reason not to fear the grave. Because of Jesus' resurrection, we know that death has been defeated. Death is no longer a permanent state, but a temporary sleep from which we will awaken to eternal life. In the resurrection, all believers will be united with God in a new, glorified existence. There will be no more tears, no more suffering, and no more death. This is the hope that sustains Christians through even the darkest moments of life. The assurance that the grave is not the end. Following this momentous event is the revelation of the new Jerusalem, a breathtaking and powerful vision described in the book of Revelation, particularly in chapters 21 and 22. The new Jerusalem is not just any city. It is the holy city of God descending from heaven to earth. This city is filled with religious symbolism and represents the ultimate fulfillment of God's divine plan. The new Jerusalem is a place where God's kingdom is fully realized, where his people will live with him forever. This city is described in intricate detail, and it is nothing short of spectacular. The new Jerusalem is a celestial city, the eternal dwelling place of the righteous. Its beauty is beyond compare, symbolizing perfection, holiness, and the glory of God. Imagine a city with towering walls made of jasper, shining with brilliance. There are twelve gates, each made from a single, flawless pearl. In the heart of the city, there's a wide, open square where a river flows, the river of life. And on both sides of this river grows the tree of life, offering healing to the nations, the symbolism here is rich, painting a picture of eternal life and peace. 
What's even more striking about this city is that there is no need for a sun or moon to light it. The glory of God provides all the light that is needed in the Lamb. Jesus Christ is its lamp. This imagery shows that in the New Jerusalem, God's presence is so overwhelming and glorious that no other source of light is necessary. It's a place where His glory shines perpetually, where His people are in His presence always. The New Jerusalem is the fulfillment of the promise made to all believers, a place where they will live with God forever. It is not just a city, but the realization of eternal life, peace, and communion with God. For those who have put their faith in Jesus, this is their ultimate destination, their true home. The trials, tribulations, and pain of this present world will be no more. Instead, Believers will experience the joy of eternal life in a city that radiates God's glory. The vision of the New Jerusalem is a powerful reminder that God's ultimate plan for humanity is not destruction, but restoration. In the end, He will make all things new. The New Jerusalem is the final chapter of God's redemptive plan, where heaven and earth are united and His people are fully restored to a perfect relationship with Him. It's a place where death and sorrow are things of the past and where life, true, eternal life, flourishes. As we contemplate these profound promises, the resurrection of the dead and the coming of the new Jerusalem, it's important to recognize that these events are not far-off, abstract ideas. They are the culmination of God's redemptive work in history. They represent the fulfillment of everything that Christians hope for. These events are about real people, real lives, and a real future. They offer hope in a world that often feels hopeless, reminding believers that no matter what happens, God's plan is unfolding, and it will end in victory for those who trust in Him. In closing, these promises, the resurrection of the dead and the new Jerusalem, give us a glimpse into the future that awaits all who put their faith in Jesus Christ. They are a powerful reminder that God's justice, love, and faithfulness are eternal and that no matter how dark things may seem, His light will prevail. Let this hope encourage us as we continue to walk in faith, trusting that God's plan for us leads not to destruction, but to eternal life with Him. Let's dive into one of the most captivating and mysterious passages in the Bible, the vision of the New Jerusalem. The New Jerusalem is a powerful image that appears in the book of Revelation and represents the ultimate promise of redemption for humanity. Revelation chapter 21, verse 2, paints a vivid picture. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. This description is packed with deep symbolism, representing a fresh beginning and a transformed state for all of creation. It offers a glimpse of hope for humanity, a place where those who have been saved will live in harmony with God for eternity. This imagery of the New Jerusalem is often interpreted as the promise of a heavenly dwelling place where the faithful will experience eternal communion with God. It's not just a physical city, but a spiritual reality, one that signifies the culmination of God's plan for the world. The New Jerusalem is described in Revelation as a city of extraordinary beauty and holiness. It descends from heaven, and its very structure reflects the glory of God. The walls are adorned with precious stones, the streets are made of pure gold, and there is no need for a sun or moon because God's light fills every corner. This city is a sanctuary where God's people will live forever, free from pain, sorrow, and death. In this vision, the new Jerusalem is compared to a bride prepared for her husband. This imagery speaks to the purity, beauty, and intimate relationship between God and His people. Just as a bride is lovingly prepared for her wedding day, the New Jerusalem is presented as the final, perfect dwelling place for those who have remained faithful to God. This is a place where the struggles of the world are left behind, and God's kingdom is fully established. The New Jerusalem represents the fulfillment of God's promise to dwell among His people, offering them peace, joy, and eternal life. Another significant event that unfolds in Revelation is the appearance of the two witnesses. These prophetic figures play a crucial role in God's plan, especially during the end times. In Revelation chapter 11, verse 3, God says, And I will appoint my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1,260 days. 
clothed in sackcloth. These two witnesses are not ordinary prophets. They are divinely appointed to proclaim God's truth during a period of great tribulation. They are described as two olive trees and two lampstands standing before the Lord, symbolizing their connection to God and the light they bring to a dark world. During their ministry, these two witnesses possess incredible power. They can turn water into blood, stop the rain, and strike the earth with plagues. This supernatural authority demonstrates that they are messengers of divine judgment. If anyone tries to harm them, fire comes out of their mouths to consume their enemies. Their mission is clear, to warn the world and call people to repentance before the return of Christ. They are a final beacon of hope and truth in a world that is spiraling toward destruction. However, their story takes a dramatic turn. When their testimony is complete, the beast from the abyss wages war against them and kills them. Their bodies are left exposed in the streets of a great city, the same city where Christ was crucified. For three and a half days, people from all over the world will see their lifeless bodies, refusing to give them a proper burial. This event is a public spectacle as the enemies of God celebrate their deaths. But the story doesn't end there. After those three and a half days, God breathes life back into the two witnesses and they rise to their feet terrifying everyone who sees them. Then, in a moment of divine power, a loud voice from heaven calls to them, saying, Come up here. The two witnesses ascend to heaven in a cloud, witnessed by their enemies. This scene is a dramatic display of God's victory over death, showing that no power on earth can thwart his plan. The ministry of the two witnesses serves as a powerful reminder of God's sovereignty and his ability to bring life out of death. Their resurrection foreshadows the final victory over evil that is to come. As we move toward the conclusion of Revelation, we come to one of the most solemn and awe-inspiring moments in all of Scripture, the final judgment. This is the moment when God will judge all of humanity, both the living and the dead. The final judgment is described with vivid apocalyptic imagery, portraying it as a time of great transformation and eternal consequence. It is deeply connected to the return of Jesus Christ in glory when he will establish his reign and bring justice to the world. The final judgment is not just an abstract idea. It is the ultimate reckoning where every soul will stand before the throne of God. The book of life will be opened and each person will be judged according to their deeds. Those whose names are written in the book of life will be granted eternal life while those who are not will face eternal separation from God. This moment represents the culmination of God's plan for justice and righteousness. The final judgment serves as a powerful reminder that our actions in this life have eternal consequences. It is a call to live faithfully, to repent, and to seek God's mercy. The New Jerusalem, the two witnesses, and the final judgment are interconnected in the larger narrative of Revelation. They represent different aspects of God's ultimate plan for the world, His promise of redemption, His call to repentance, and His final act of justice. These events challenge us to reflect on our own lives, our faith, and our relationship with God. They remind us that while the world may seem chaotic and full of suffering, God's plan is unfolding and His victory is assured. In conclusion, the vision of the New Jerusalem is a promise of hope offering believers a glimpse of their future home in God's eternal kingdom. The two witnesses represent God's final call to repentance in a world resistant to His truth, while the final judgment is the ultimate moment of accountability for all humanity. Together, these elements form a powerful narrative of God's love, justice, and desire for all people to come to Him. For those who follow Christ, these events are not a cause for fear but a source of hope, as they point to the day when God will make all things new. Jesus Christ will return in great power and glory to judge both the living and the dead. At this final judgment, humanity will be divided based on their actions, and this separation will be guided by moral and spiritual criteria. The righteous will receive the reward of eternal life with God, while those who have chosen a path of evil will face condemnation. The Bible also teaches about the resurrection of the dead, where everyone who has ever lived will be raised to face this ultimate judgment. 
It's a powerful moment when each person is held accountable for their life, choices, and faithfulness. After the final judgment, a new era begins, a time of restoration and renewal for all of creation. The heavens and the earth will be transformed, and God will establish a new heaven and a new earth, free from evil, pain, and corruption. This is the ultimate defeat of evil, where Satan and all forces of darkness are judged and sentenced to eternal punishment. The triumph of good over evil is complete, and God's eternal reign of peace and righteousness begins. As we reflect on this profound vision, it's important to take a moment to examine our own lives. Are we living in alignment with God's will? Are we prepared for the day when Christ returns to judge the world? These are not just distant abstract ideas. They are part of the Christian faith's core message, a reminder that how we live today echoes into eternity. If this journey through scripture has touched you, I invite you to share your thoughts and experiences in the comments. Let's keep the conversation going. May God continue to guide and strengthen you in your faith. If you found this video helpful or inspiring, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. We've got more powerful content ahead, diving deep into the truths of the Bible. Thanks for watching, and I hope you'll join us again as we explore more of God's Word in future videos.